Good morning and welcome to worship here on this beautiful day in Willow, Alaska. We're glad that you are joining us, especially if this is your first time to join us. My name is Christina Dowling Soka and I, along with my spouse, Jody Dowling Soka, are the pastors here at Willow. And on behalf of the whole congregation, we welcome you. Our service today is a very special service. It's Human Relations Day in the United Methodist Church. And so we're having a special service where we weave in some of the prayers of Martin Luther King Jr. and where we focus on this Epiphany Sunday on the calling of Jesus. Mary Lemmings is our pianist this morning. We want to say a special thank you to her and our scriptures are read today by Julie Mitchell and Jeff Bertrand. And a special thanks also to BJ Eldred for the beautiful altar. You'll be helped in the service. We want you to participate, to sing the songs and pray the prayers, do the responses with us. And you'll be helped if you download the bulletin wherever you found this video. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for joining us and welcome. together in the greeting. You'll find the words in your bulletin. Lord God, you call your people to tasks we would not ourselves choose. Give us the grace to love you enough to follow when you call. You know our weakness and have promised to give resources for that which you ask of us. We praise you for your generous care. Like Samuel, let us say, here I am. God of surprising light, here we are. We are surrounded, O oh God, with people who need to hear the story, people who need to meet the one from Nazareth, Jesus, our Lord. Make our places of worship, places of hospitality and welcome. Make our words and actions, words and actions of invitation. Like Philip, let us say, come and see. God of surprising light, here we are. Our hymn is Lord of the Dance, 261 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
Sunday, we remember and give thanks for the life of Martin Luther King Jr., one who stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets, engaging and reminding the world that we're not there yet. While there is still injustice, we're not there yet. While there is still war, we're not there yet. While there is still prejudice, we're not there yet. While there is still systemic and individual racism, we're not there yet. While there are still white supremacists. We're not there yet. While there is still poverty. We're not there yet. Forgive us, Lord. We lament our brokenness and pray for healing in our hearts, in our souls, in our nation, in our world. Today, we will listen for Christ's calling. We will listen for the voice of Jesus calling us to come and see. May we also listen to Christ's calling to come and be. May we be agents of healing and work for a just peace. May we be true disciples who stand for truth and justice, who draw the circle wide, including all at God's table of grace. May we be children of God who dare to reflect the light of God's love. To come and be is the beginning of a joining a movement and not just observing a season or a holiday, a special Sunday dedicated to human relations. The movement is the kingdom of God creating the world that Jesus dreamed of when he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. And so in that spirit on this Human Relations Day, we share a few of the prayers of Martin Luther King Jr. to inspire us as we live and work towards God's dream in this time and in this place. God, help us as individuals and as a world to hear it now before it is too late. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's justice and all these other things shall be added unto you. 
We thank you for your church founded upon your word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the reign of our Lord and our God. God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. Grant that we will love you with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves, even as our enemy neighbors. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, to be with us in our going out and our coming in, in our rising up and in our lying down, in our moments of joy and in our moments of sorrow, until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn. Amen. Amen. Together, let us sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you call me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to all the children to come up close to the screen for our children's time. I wanted to tell you about the season of the year that we're in. We're in a season that is called Epiphany. Can you say that? Epiphany. And in the season of Epiphany, we have many things that we celebrate. We celebrate the star. Can you make a star with your hands? The star that the wise ones followed to go and see Jesus. And we 
Remember the baptism of Jesus? Woo. We remember how we can all be lights and shine like Jesus did, and we can bring light into our world. And we also remember how Jesus called the disciples. I wanted to sing a little song with you about how Jesus called his disciples. Can you get your counting hands ready? Peter, James, and John in a fishing boat. Try that. Peter, James, and John in a fishing boat. Peter, James, and John in a fishing boat. Peter, James, and John in a fishing boat out on the deep blue sea. Can you pretend like you're fishing? Throw your net. Fished all night, but they caught no fishes. Fished all night, but they caught no fishes. Fished all night, but they caught no fishes out on the deep blue sea. Jesus came walking down by the water. Jesus came walking down by the water. Jesus came walking down by the water, out on the deep blue sea. Jesus showed the fishermen where to fish. Jesus showed the fishermen where to fish. Jesus showed the fishermen where to fish, out on the deep blue sea. Now the little boat is filled with fishes. Now the little boat is filled with fishes. Now the little boat is filled with fishes out on the deep blue sea. Jesus says, come follow me. Jesus says, come follow me. Jesus says, come follow me out by the deep blue sea. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the season of epiphany. Help us to follow Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks for coming up. Our second reading this morning is from John chapter 1. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, I give you thanks for each person who is worshiping with us this day. May we open our ears and our hearts to your message. May your light shine upon us. Teach us your words of wisdom and grace. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I love this season of epiphany that we are in, the season of remembering starlight and wonder, the journey of the Magi, the baptism of Jesus, the call of the disciples, the call of you and me. It's a season of seeking, a seeking, seeking and finding, a season of searching. I also love the story that Robert Fulgham tells in one of his wonderful essays in the book, All I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He asks the question, did you ever play hide and seek when you were a child? One day he was there working at his desk, writing, and outside children were playing hide and seek. And he noticed that right outside his window under a big pile of leaves was one child 
who was hiding too well. <laughs> the rest of the children had been found and they had gone on. This child was still hiding. And he considered going outside, but finally he just opened up the window and he just yelled as loud as he could, get found, kid. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it scared the child so bad that he jumped up, wet his pants, started crying and ran all the way home. Bull Jim commented, it's hard to know how to be helpful sometimes. So we begin our sermon this morning. I want to read you the rest of his essay. It's tremendous. It goes like this. He says, a man I know found out last year he had terminal cancer. He was a doctor. He knew he was dying, but he didn't want to make his family and friends suffer through that. So he kept his secret and he died. And everybody said how brave he was to bear his suffering in silence and not tell everybody and so on and so forth. But privately, his family said how angry and hurt they were that he didn't need them, didn't trust their strength. And it hurt that he didn't say goodbye. You see, he had hidden too well. Getting found would have kept him in the game. It was hide and seek, grown up style, wanting to hide, needing to be sought, confused about being found. I don't know, want anyone to know what will people think. I don't want to bother anyone. And then Fulgham ends with this. He says, better than hide and seek. I like the game called sardines. In sardines, the person who is it goes and hides, and then everybody goes looking for him. And when you find that person, you get in with them, and you hide there with them, and pretty soon everybody is hiding there together, all stacked up in a small space like sardines or like puppies in a pile. And pretty soon, somebody giggles and somebody laughs, and everybody gets found. Medieval theologians describe God in hide-and-seek terms. He writes, calling him God, Deus Absconticus. But me, I think God is a sardine player and will be found the same way everybody gets found in sardines, by the sound of laughter and those heaped together at the end. Ali, ali, oxen free. The kids out in the street are hollering and crying, a cry that says, come on in. Wherever you are, it's a new game. And so I say to those who have hidden too well, get found, kid. Ali, Ali, oxen free. As I read the scriptures, I hear story after story of God speaking into the silence. Get found. Get found, kid. Get found, child. Get found, church. And as you listen and look deep, you hear that there's this deep longing in the heart of God for all of us who have lost our way, all of us who are hiding or broken, to find our way and to come on home. We don't need to hide any longer. Have you ever been lost? I remember the first time that I really did remember being lost. It was at the all-church picnic, West Palm Beach, Florida. Daddy was the pastor. Mama was a retired missionary. We were in the big field, the Florida pines all around. They were having a meal. There were so many people, and I was a three-year-old. And I suddenly felt alone, and I felt lost. And I was looking for my daddy. I couldn't find him. And then finally I found him. It was his pant leg. Well, I grabbed on with my whole might and held tight. And everything was okay until I looked up and realized that I had grabbed on to the wrong leg. And then there was a whale coming out of little Chrissy that you couldn't have believed possible, a whale that reached to the highest of heavens. I wailed as only an angry three-year-old can wail. We get lost sometimes. We're holding on to the wrong thing. We lose our way as people, as a nation, as individuals, as communities. We lose our way whenever we lose sight of the humanity of each other. Whenever we let hatred or racism or violence in any form win, whenever we lose our civility in how we speak and dialogue with each other, when we forget that love and justice, servant love in the style of Christ must be at the center of our everything that we do. Remember how Micah says it, what does the Lord require of you but to seek justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. We lose our way when we forget to seek justice, when we are unkind, when we don't walk humbly with our God. We lose our way when we forget that God doesn't play favorites, when we get so busy that we lose sight of people who matter the most. Stephen Covey once said it this way. He said, you can spend your whole life climbing the ladder of success only to discover it's leaning 
against the wrong wall. We lose our way when we try to fill up the empty spaces in our lives with anything but Christ. We lose our way when we choose hatred instead of love, when we push our, put ourselves above others. We lose our way when we equate violence with the way of Christ. There are countless ways that we can lose our way. And yet, church, the dominant theme of scripture, the dominant image is that ours is a God who seeks and saves the lost. Ours is a God who won't give up on you, a God who will continue to seek you and calls you to a different way, to seek forgiveness, to choose the way of love, the way of peace, the way of the cross over the way of the world. There's this deep longing in the heart of God for injustices to be righted, for the hungry to be fed, for the outcast to be included, for the lost to be found. I don't know about you, but I, as an adult, have been lost many times. I often was lost in those moments when we as a family journeyed through illnesses with my folks, particularly the illness of Alzheimer's with my mother. It was so many days where I just didn't know where to turn. This life is hard sometimes. God doesn't plop the bad things upon us, but God promises to be with us through it all. I've been lost this year as a pastor as we've navigated our way through the pandemic and so many questions about how we can continue to be the church together. I've been lost when we as a nation have been confronted by the depths of our racism, as we've discovered deep fractures in our society. I've been lost as we heard report after report of persons of color being killed because of fear of their color, as we saw a person killed before our eyes in the evening news saying, I can't breathe. I've been lost in the midst of the violence that followed that, the emboldening of hatred, lost in the midst of deep divisions. I felt lost last Wednesday and so disappointed when I saw that Confederate flag in the Capitol and the blasphemy of signs professing love in Jesus and support of those acts of violence that went beyond the right of protest. And it's so easy to look at the racism, the blatant racism, and forget I'm lost when I look at the racism in my own heart. We are lost and we are broken and we are need in healing. And yet the word that comes to me in the midst of all our lostness, in the midst of all our lostness, the word that comes is that all is not lost. What is it? that helps you in the times when you are lost. I was speechless in the wake of a week ago. When I was listening to sermons last week, and my friend, uh, Catherine Nance, she's the preacher of one of our supporting churches, Church Street United Methodist in Knoxville, Tennessee. And she mentioned how a song kept coming to her from her childhood. Maybe you remember, this is my father's world. One of the verses goes, let me not forget that though the wrong seems all so strong, God is the ruler yet. And church, I have to think that the God who swept over chaos when this world was created can move over the chaos in your life and in mine, can move over the chaos in this world and help to recreate us, help to help us find our way home. There's a beautiful book in Chronicles that says it this way, it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Ah, church, don't we need healing? May we pray for healing in our lives, in our communities, in our nation, in our world. May we pray for a peaceful transition of power this week. May we pray for our outgoing and our incoming president. May we pray this week that our country truly becomes a country of liberty and justice for all. May we find our way back home to God. In our Old Testament text, Eli and his people had lost their way. It says that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It says that Eli wasn't seen very well. The light in his life was dim. He was a priest, and he had turned a blind 
eye to the injustices being perpetrated in his community, in fact, by his very own children. He didn't control their abusiveness. They had lost their way. And yet, in the middle of the night, God calls a child who is staying with him there, <laughs> helping to learn how the ways of a priest, Samuel, who is living in that same home, he's laying there at night and he hears a voice. You know this story. It's beloved from our Sunday school days. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel thinks that Eli is calling him. And he comes to Eli several times and says, here I am. Did you call me? What do you want? And finally, Eli keeps sending him back to bed. Finally, he recognizes that God is speaking. And he says, go back, lay down and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And God calls Samuel, and Samuel becomes a true speaker, even telling Eli that he has lost his way. I love Samuel's words when he hears those callings. He says, here I am. In the ancient language, the word for here I am is hineni, H-I-N-E-N-I. And church, I believe that we are called to say hineni, here I am to God. We are called to be peacemakers, called to stand for justice and truth, for reconciliation. It's not an easy call. The author of this week's working preacher, Corey Driver, points out that when one says, here I am to God in scripture, one is about to be called to a journey of very difficult proportions. He points out that Abraham said this when he was called up the mountain with Isaac, that Moses said this when God called him back to Egypt, that Isaiah said this when he was called to prophesy judgment in Israel, that Ananias said this before God commanded him to heal Saul, who was the arch persecutor of the church. Remember how that old beautiful song goes, uh, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord, I have heard you calling in the night, I will go, Lord, if you leave me, I will hold your people in my heart. Songwriter Dan Shute, I believe, captures in this song the passion and the heart of God. God, in this text, is crying out for those who have chosen darkness over light, those who have hearts of stone, those who turn away. And there is this image that we are called to hold even the persons with hearts of stone in our hearts, that we are called to hold all of God's people, even our enemies, in our hearts. And that brings us to our beautiful gospel text. We sort of jumped into the middle of the passage. The story of the calling of Nathaniel comes right after John has baptized Jesus, after he sees the Holy Spirit. John is with two of his disciples, and he pretty much says, Come and see, you've got to see this person upon whom I saw the Holy Spirit descend. Well, one of those followers of John is, is Andrew, and it says that, that uh, John, he's not jealous. Uh, those two disciples leave him, and they, they start to follow Jesus. Jesus looks back, and they, he says to them, What do you want? And they, uh, they startle, and they say, oh, Where are you staying? And Jesus in the spirit says, come and see. I love that word staying. It's the same word that's used. Uh, meaning, M-E-N-E, -E, it's the word which means abide, the same word that's used in John 15, where Jesus talks about how important it is to abide with him, the same word that describes the spirit abiding with Jesus. He says, come and see. Over and over again, these words are heard in the gospel of John. And I love what the scholars say about the word see. It's more than just ordinary seeing. It's perceiving, understanding, knowing in our hearts of hearts, inviting us to look closely, to enter fully. It's the kind of seeing that can transform us. The author, you see, of the book of John has this passion that each of his hearers will come to know Jesus, that they'll see Jesus for who Jesus is and that they will find life in his name, that they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. He has a passion that they will know Jesus as their way, their truth, their life, their light, their eternal life, that they will let Jesus be their bread, their good shepherd, the peacemaker in their hearts, that they will be filled to overflowing with the abundant grace of God. 
Well, I love what happens. Uh, Andrew and his friend arrive at the place where Jesus is staying about four o'clock. And the scriptures seem to indicate that they stayed there for hours and hours. The way you read the Greek, it seems as though they are there almost all night. 14 hours with Jesus. Ah, church, what would happen if we immersed ourselves in the scriptures for 14 hours? I love Andrew, and I believe this experience of closeness with Jesus totally changes who he is. He's always the one helping others to come and see. He brings the child to Jesus with those loaves and fishes. He brings the Greeks to Jesus. And the first thing he does in our text today, he goes and finds his older brother, Simon Peter. He says, Simon Peter, you got to come and see. And then the coming and seeing ministry goes on. They were all from this little town of Bethsaida. You see, they had grown up together, played together. And Philip comes and his heart is transformed, his heart is captured. Philip goes and finds his co-worker, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, you got to come and see. You simply got to come and see. At that point, Nathaniel's prejudices tumble out. He says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, Nathaniel comes and sees Jesus and Jesus speaks to him. And he says, Nathaniel, I saw you under that fig tree. And he says, I know your heart. And Nathaniel falls down and worships him. In all of these stories, persons' hearts were captured by Jesus, and they can't contain themselves. They go out and find others, and they help others to see. There's a whole lot of finding in the Gospels, a whole lot of finding. Peter was found by Andrew. Jesus found Philip. Philip finds Nathaniel. The story goes on the more you spend time with Jesus the more you seek to find others. And it's not long after this story that they'll be headed to Samaria to find the woman at the well who became the first one to witness to who Jesus was, this foreigner of a woman. He welcomes Nicodemus in his lostness. He finds the rich tax collector Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke up in a tree. He's there seeking and saving the lost, touching the outcasts, healing the lepers, freeing the sex workers. Time and time again, he is there. In chapter 9, he goes and sees that person who has been excluded, cast out of the synagogue, this person who he healed who was blind, and he goes and finds him. You see, I believe that finding the quest, the passion to find God's children is at the heart of who God is. Come and see. There's a story that's told of a rich donor who was visiting Calcutta and met Mother Teresa. She pulled out her checkbook and said, how can I help you in your work? Well, Mother Teresa pressed the checkbook back into the, mother's, into the woman's purse, and she took her by her hand and said, come and see. And she led the woman to an impoverished burial, and she found a hungry, frail child, and she said, care for her. And the woman took the child in her lap, her, wiped her brow, and fed her, and it changed her life. Mother Teresa said, when we care for a child, we are caring for Jesus. When we love the unloved, we are loving Jesus. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know. If you feel unloved, I hope you know that yours is a God, that God loves you, and that God wants to welcome you home. Maybe you've rejected God. Maybe you've rejected God because you've been rejected by the very church that should have welcomed you. If so, Know that you are welcome here in this virtual space. Know that you don't have to hide who you are. Know that you are loved as you are. Know that if your life is turned topsy upside down, messed up, it is okay. I love how one friend said it, that the church was never meant to be a museum for saints, but is a hospital for sinners. Maybe you're like my little four-year-old self and you grabbed on to the wrong thing. You grabbed on, you looked up, and you discover that you're holding on to the wrong person. Well, that wasn't the end of the story on that day. From way across the field of tall pines, my sweet preacher daddy heard my cry. He ran to find me in my lostness. He gathered me up, and he lifted me in his arms, and he twirled me around. And my tears turned to laughter. Twirl me around, daddy, one more time. Just one more time. Jesus calls us, he finds us, he wants to heal us. And he says to us, come 
and see. Come and see. In the end, this season of epiphany is about saying yes to Jesus' calling, finding our vocation, finding how we can use the gifts God has placed us within us to bring healing in our families and in our world. I want to close with one more story. It's a story also from Robert Fulgham. He says that near the island, on the island of Crete, near the village of Gonia, there sits a Greek Orthodox monastery. And on the land adjacent to this monastery is an institute dedicated to human understanding and peace. It was built especially to try to bring peace between the Germans and the people of the island of Crete after the war. It overlooks a place where tragedy happened. In this location, Nazi paratroopers, Nazi paratroopers invaded Crete. They were met by peasants protecting themselves, wielding kitchen knives and hay scythes. And in retribution, the Germans then lined up and shot whole villages. Well, Alexander Papaderos has founded this institute. He himself was interred in a Nazi concentration camp as a young uh, child for his role as a messenger for the people of the island of Crete. He had this vision, though, that hatred could not win, even after that great tragedy. He had this vision that Germans and Cretes could set an example for the rest of the world. He had this vision that if they could find peace and forgiveness, anyone could. Well, Fulgham was attending an institute. It was very helpful. And Papadaris had finished up. And as he was leaving, he asked a question that many scholars ask at the end of the lecture. Do you have any questions? Fulgham, always the jokester, threw out, just joking, what is the meaning of life? He often said that at the end of a lecture. Well, Papadaris, so people began to laugh and gather up their stuff, but Papadaris held up his hand and he said, do you really want to know? I have an answer to your question. And he said, sit down. At that point, he took out his wallet and he fished out of that wallet a very small round mirror about the size of a quarter. And he told this story. He said, when I was a small child, during the war, we were very poor. We lived in a remote village. One day, I found a broken piece of mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them together, but it wasn't possible. What I fit, I kept the largest piece, and I began to play with it as a toy. I began to be fascinated by the fact that it could reflect light in the darkest of places where the sun would never shine, in deep holes and crevices, darkest closets. I began to play a game. The game was to get the light into the most inaccessible places. He says, I kept the mirror. And as I grew up, I began to understand that this wasn't just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I began to understand that I am not the light or the source of the light, but that light, God's love, truth, understanding, knowledge is there and it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world and change some things in some people. Perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of the light, of my life. And then the story goes as he took that mirror and he held it very carefully and he caught the light in that room and he began to shine the light one by one by one on each face there and then he rested it on Robert's face and then he shone the light on Robert's hands where they were folded on the desk Robert said, much of what I experienced, a way of information about Greek culture and history that summer is gone from my memory. But in the wallet of my mind, I carry a small, round mirror still. Are there any questions? Church, Jesus says, 
come and see. Jesus says, come home to me. Jesus says, let me be your calling, your life. Let my light shine through you. And what can we say, church? But here I am, Lord. Here I am. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you and bless you and heal you this day. Our hymn of response is, Here I Am, Lord. Sing it with us. Isaiah rang out, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Empower your church, O God, to ring out the good news of the light of your Son, Jesus, which pierces even the deepest darknesses. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As a star rose high into the nighttime sky, 
to draw the nations to the Christ child. Send your blessing, O God, on this nation and every nation, and draw the whole world to your peace and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As John the Baptist guided throngs of people to the edge of the wilderness and baptized Jesus in the River Jordan, we pray that you would guide our country and our leaders to the ways of justice and righteousness. We pray for a peaceful transition this week for our outgoing and in coming presidents. Bring healing and peace to our nation which has been so divided. May we put love of God and neighbor first in all we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Like the Magi who traveled afar to bring gifts and to celebrate the Savior's birth, we pray for this community and for those who celebrate their own birthdays and anniversaries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus climbed the mountaintop and proclaimed blessings on the people of the world, we pray for the sick and the distressed and all who care for them. We especially pray for those who have been impacted by this virus, for those fighting cancer, for those recovering from surgery or falls, those who face illness of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus called his disciples to leave their nets and boats and follow him, we pray that we might hear your voice calling us to come and see. May we come and be your disciples too. May we rise up to follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, light of the world, Hear our prayers and make us reflection of your light. That the places of darkness in our world would be pierced by your light. And that all would be drawn to you and be overwhelmed with joy. Amen. And together as children of Jesus, we pray his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our hymn of affirmation is the summons, 2130 in the faith we sing.
the blessing together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go now in peace. you joined us today in worship and we pray that as you go from this place that you will hear Christ saying come and see and that you and I that we all will respond with those words here I am we pray that you've been blessed and as we say every week we hope and pray that as you go from this place that you will be generous generous with yourself generous with your neighbor as Christ defines neighbor and generous with your church the address of the church is P.O. Box 182, Willow, Alaska, if you would like to help support the ministries. Now, go in peace and go in joy and know that Jesus loves you and goes with you. Alleluia. Thanks be to God.